you know, in my classes, I think we've always had really good uh, conversations and there's so much that I'm learning from students about things that I, I didn't necessarily um, consider. A UNC criminal justice professor re-examines his curriculum after the increased visibility of police brutality. So that was the goal of many black people to own their own home and own land because it gives you power. We get introduced to an American frontier community founded by and for black Americans. We represented it, not only just in black cultural centers, but we were the first cultural center on this campus. We take a look at the history behind UNC's first cultural center. Bear News starts now. Hello, I'm Mia Olivas. And I'm Alani Cassiano. And welcome to a special Black Heritage Month edition of Bear News. Over the last decade, police brutality has been an ongoing issue throughout the United States. So much so that it is causing one UNC professor to adjust their class to better reflect the current times. Bear News reporter Isabella Marcus Porter tells us more. The officers were fired after an internal police investigation on January 7th for the arrest of Tyree Nichols, who died in the hospital three days later. The officers pleaded not guilty to charges of second-degree murder, aggravated assault, aggravated kidnapping, official misconduct, and official oppression. They are all out on bond, and their next hearing is scheduled for May 1st. What really stands out to me that's different in this incident is that there were five officers, and not one of them was like, hey, like, maybe we should, like, slow down and, like, give, like stop giving this guy all these commands, like, where was the leadership in that position? Where were all these other officers uh, stepping in um, to stop them from using this uh, aggressive force? And so to me, that speaks larger to the systemic issues where uh, in racist questions of how we are training officers. Dr. Patrick Brady is a criminal justice professor at UNC who specializes in identifying factors that contribute to trauma and burnout in policing and how agencies can reduce burnout. He also specializes in researching officer decision making and he wrote his dissertation on burnout amongst police chiefs. It is required for students in the criminal justice major to take classes in policing, which Brady has taught at UNC for two years. I spoke with him about excessive force and how classes have changed since this has become such a polarizing topic. You know, we have a, a huge, you know, incident every month or every three months and things like that. And so it almost gets to the point where it becomes exhausting. And so I, I definitely kind of want to balance the idea of like using or finding opportunities to learn from these experiences with the same time balancing, you know, the the stress and, and frustration that I think we all feel where um, when we witness another video going viral of, of someone uh being murdered or and or seriously injured by a police officer policing. and so um I, I i regularly try to create opportunities for students to um share their experiences and and try to pose questions that spark um discussions about um what's going on and so um you know in my classes i think we've always had really good uh conversations and there's so much that i'm learning from students about things that i i didn't necessarily um consider Brady was a professor in Georgia for four years. He saw the hurt and protest effects on students during the George Floyd and Richard Brooks cases. More that we need to uh, learn about this and study this, uh, but it doesn't matter how much we learn or, or study this. It's never going to, you know, really kind of ad address the pain that is experienced, uh, particularly among marginalized community um, who feel like it, it, like the, it's just never, they're never going to get a break uh, and that their voices are never going to be heard. Brady said a lot of students get into criminal justice and policing to be the change they want to see. Students that want to get into policing, they want to get into policing for the right reasons. So they, they see what's going on uh, uh, with policing and, you know, and I see this a lot among students of color and first generation students um, who want to get into becoming a police officer so that they can represent the change that they want to see. You know, they want to be that person that changes, you know, um, a hater's mind about the police um, by, you know, protecting and serving them. Majority of what policing is, is using words, providing service, and ordering maintenance to a community. He says that criminal justice students need to understand how to work with victims, including homicide cases, excessive force victims, victims' family members, to be the best practitioners they can be. 
Out of 700 criminal justice programs that Brady researched, 11% required criminal justice students to take victim-based courses. UNC is one of the 11% that required students to take that course, which was one of the reasons Brady decided to come teach here at UNC. I think one of the biggest frustrations with uh, you know communities of color is that they see this over and over and over again of officers never being held accountable. Um, and so I think we do need to see officers being held accountable more often. And, and we are starting to see that, but um, you know, one or two officers being held accountable every now and then is, is never gonna you know, impact the, the, the historical trauma that has been inflicted by police on the communities of, of color. And so I commend this speedy response to address this, but why is, why is the speedy response happening in 2023? when, you know, these, these use of force, uh, when, you know, the Rodney King incident happened, you know, before the 2000s. For Bear News, I'm Isabella Marcus-Porter. Thanks, Isabella. For more on UNC professors and their areas of expertise, stay tuned to Bear News. For every story about what life has been like for Black people in America, there are just as many stories shoved under the rug. One story that hardly sees the light of day is the story of Deerfield here in Colorado. The UNC professors are involved in restoring the town and making it into a national historic site. Bear News reporter Will Coleman tells us more. The word deer was chosen as the town's name because of the precious value of the land and community to Oliver Tucson Jackson, the town's founder. Deerfield was an experiment right in our own backyard, an African-American founded colony for other African-Americans. Deerfield was an African-American homestead community that was founded in 1910. And it was so that African-Americans could have their own home, their own lands, and so forth. And that was the philosophy of the founder, Mr. O.T. Jackson. So that was the goal of many black people, to own their own home and own land, because it gives you power. And also you can pass it down to your children and grandchildren. Deerfield was developed so that it would be a farming community and just a, a very important kind of symbol for many other African Americans. People from Deerfield came from all walks of life. Uh, they were not only the ones that were successful, but they were people that were just dirt poor. Uh, and Deerfield was extremely well known among the African American population throughout the country and was very well regarded. And it was considered to be a, a grand experiment that uh, black people could uh, take charge of their own destinies and uh, make opportunities for not only themselves, but their families and the families, the, the, the generations to come. Black Heritage Month is a time to celebrate black accomplishments and highlight history. The Deerfield Project challenges the historically white narrative of the American frontier, proving that African Americans played a pivotal role in settling the West. When looking at this history, you have to understand that this was done by black people when at the same time there are people who are saying black people couldn't do this. It's impossible for them to, uh, to be successful in farming and so forth. And Deerfield showed that people like that were wrong. You know, Deerfield is a really important um, story in American history. It's a really important story here in Northern Colorado. You tell history from looking at documents, right? From looking at um, the letters and looking at these photographs. This is what lets us know what was happening in Deerfield so that we can talk about the African-American experience on the plains of Northern Colorado. Deerfield was a symbol of African-American empowerment. Founded only 55 years after the 13th Amendment, Deerfield was pioneering relations between African-Americans and other races. But Deerfield had his own uh, amateur baseball league and they played against all the other white teams in the area and they didn't really have any problems with that. Deerfield is currently undergoing preservation to teach future generations about black history and may soon be recognized as Colorado's 27th National Historic Site. For Bear News, I'm Will Coleman. Thanks, Will. Stay tuned, Bear News, as later in the semester, we will be taking a much deeper look into the Deerfield Project. The roots of Black Heritage Month, also called Black History Month, started in 1915, half a century after the 13th Amendment abolished slavery in the United States. Carter G. Woodson, a Harvard-educated historian, founded what would become the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, which is an organization dedicated to researching and promoting achievements of black Americans and other people of African descent. 
The group was founded in 1915, and in 1916, Woodson held a week-long event in celebration of black history. He chose the second week of February to coincide with Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass's birthdays. Slowly, this week started gaining traction and began to expand. The first Black History Month was on college campuses. Black History Month was proposed by black educators and students at Kent State University in February 1969 and was later celebrated a year later from January 2nd until February 28, 1970. Six years later, President Gerald Ford recognized Black History Month during the celebration of the Bicentennial, at which point it officially covered the whole month of February. Recently, many organizations have shifted from using Black History Month to Black Heritage Month. History is by its nature viewed as the past, while using heritage highlights that these roots are still a part of modern black culture. Janine Weaver Douglas, director of the Marcus Garvey Cultural Center, talked to us about the importance of understanding the fact that black culture is multifaceted. Black culture has impacted the entire world and Black Heritage Month is all about celebrating those impacts. All of these different aspects of blackness that wouldn't other, you wouldn't otherwise integrate into your daily understanding or celebrate, we get to talk about those. And so we make an intentional focus on the language of heritage because it is not about our identity, it is about our culture. And that's how you sort of share and express and, and appreciate the culture. The Marcus Garvey Cultural Center is a safe space for black students to study, seek help, or just as a place to come and hang out. But how did UNC's Black Cultural Center get its start? Bear News reporter Jordan Stone tells us more. The Marcus Garvey Cultural Center was inspired by an era of campus activism in the late 1960s. Members of the university's Black Student Union first proposed the idea of a Black Cultural Center in 1971, but was met with resistance. Twelve years later, after the initial proposal, under the leadership of the Black Studies Program, President Robert Dickinson and the Black Student Union of 1983, the Black Cultural Center opened its doors on February 1st, 1983. In conjunction with Black History Awareness Month, the center was later named the Marcus Garvey Cultural Center. And so we specifically have that name because of the necessity for black individuals or black people to have spaces that belong to them. The Marcus Garvey Cultural Center is named after Marcus Mosiah Garvey. He was the youngest of 11 children born into a poor Jamaican family. Garvey was probably the most charismatic Afro-American leader until Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Janine Weber Douglas has been the director of the Marcus Garvey Cultural Center since July of 2021. Garvey is specifically for, bra for black African and African American students, staff, and faculty. And so ensuring that we have both educational, leadership, emotional, and social programming and events and support is my role. The Garvey Center was the first cultural center on the UNC campus. We enjoy the privilege of being the center that really created a lot of the work you see in other centers. We represented it not only just in black cultural centers, but we were the first cultural center on this campus. The Garvey Center enjoys the privilege of being the center that created a lot of the work seen in other centers. We were the first named cultural center. And so there were CSU's cultural center um, started, they started organizing their center about two years before us. And so we are in a group of centers that were all started around the same time. Um, we are one of the few centers that is named after a person. Learn more about the Marcus Garvey Cultural Center by visiting them online or at the center Monday through Friday between 9 to 5 p.m. We would love to see you. We always have snacks. We have heat and air and a kitchen. Jordan and Leo reporting for Bear News. For more information on the Marcus Garvey Cultural Center, head on over to their website or check out their social media pages. Museum for Black Girls returns to Denver for Black Heritage Month. After closing in 2021, the museum is reopening with a new location along the 16th Street Mall. Inside the museum is an immersive experience highlighting the stories, achievements, and history of black women. The self-funded museum is a love letter to black women and creates a place for women of all ages to feel safe, comfortable, and accepted. 
All locations are filled with fun selfie installations, murals embracing beauty, art created by black women, and positive affirmations. Earlier this week, Bear News had the opportunity to learn more about the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and all that it does. I spoke to Tobias Guzman, Vice President of the Division, and dove deeper into the importance of having the DEI here on campus and what the Division is trying to accomplish. What we do is we do a lot of educating uh, campus-wide, and it's not just for students, but it's also for faculty and staff. Guzman discussed his life experiences and how that influenced his passion for helping minorities and historically marginalized students. And I wanted to go to the school that was one block away and not go to the public school that was a little bit further away. Distance was not the issue. But what was the issue was that I wanted to be able to go to a place where I could learn and be a part of something that ultimately was not really made for me, and that was a private high school that um, cost probably about $3,000 to go to every year. Um, that's where I learned about this inequality. And what I am working toward today is making sure that education for everyone um, is a possibility. To learn more about Dr. Guzman and the division, you can see the full interview on our website, YouTube channel, and on our Facebook page. Guzman is not alone leading the charge for equality and inclusivity here on campus. Bear News reporter Yvonne De La Garza talked to a group of students who are also pushing for change. Many students see an issue of inequality here at UNC. There's students, members of Black Students Union, about their experience here at UNC. So being able to just have a group or a community that um, share like the same experiences, same identities, that you can relate to, it really helps to make you feel as if you belong here on campus and that you have people who can understand you and trust you and such. UNC student, Junielle Figures, would like more input on, more on issues relevant to her and other people of color. I think getting the opinions from students of color is the best way to go at it at first because they're not gonna know where to start if they don't know the thoughts and opinions of their students of color. When I asked them on their opinion on UNC's efforts to bridge inequality, is what they had to say. I can tell, like, with the survey that Tobias sent out last semester, um, I think that was a great first step as to just getting students' opinions overall. We all know that diversity, equity, and inclusion in our work and in our personal lives is incredibly important. Recruitment officer Tiffany Martin says the lack of diversity leads to low enrollment. Since there's already a low number of, like, black students on campus, it's just been hard, like, getting new members to come into our event. It's pretty much we see the, like, the same people at our events, so getting the new numbers in is very, very hard. And he's right, as only 181 students as of spring of 2023 identify as African American. That's only 4% of the student population. Students, staff, and faculty recognize the gap in inequality. The welcoming of all students, regardless of color, is a UNC priority. I am Ivan de la Garza, Bear News. Thanks, Ivan. For more information on Black Student Union, head over to their Instagram page at BSUNCO. The skate night hosted by UNC's Black is Punk exhibit shined a light on how roller skating has been significant for the Black community. Bear News reporter Isabella Marcus Porter tells us more. Last semester, the Black is Punk exhibit hosted a skate night in the B parking lot. This event was significant for one of the creators, Nakaya Lawson, who grew up with skating being a way to connect with the Black community. So roller skating was a core part of my childhood. Um, I grew up in a predominantly white school. So the time that I had to be a part of the black community was Saturday and Sunday nights at the roller skating rink. Lawson isn't the only person to find roller skating as a significant way to connect with the black community. There's also a long history of roller skating being an escape before and during the civil rights movement. During the 1950s, roller rinks only offered one night a week where the black community was able to come together and skate. These nights were called black nights while the other nights were called white nights. During the civil rights movement, many roller rinks didn't want to stop segregating their establishments as to not lose their white customer base, so they changed the names of Black Knights to Soul Knight and Martin Luther King Knight, while White Knights were changed to things like Top 40s Knight and Family Knight. Roller rinks would still implement policies that segregated against stylization and culture of black community, but cities like Central Park, New York and Los Angeles, California were the first city sanctuaries for black skating, and there was a surge of black roller skating rinks 
where skaters were able to skate freely during the 1960s. The civil rights movement and roller skating collided when a man named Ledger Smith skated 685 miles to attend Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech wearing a sign saying freedom. This journey started in Chicago on August 17, 1963, and ended 10 days later in Washington, D.C. He ran five miles every day in two weeks, which prepared him to skate for 10 hours a day. Last semester, Alani Cassiano talked to the creators of the Blackest Punk exhibit. Lawson shared why it was important for them to host a skating night. I thought it would just be fun for like our first kind of kickoff community programming to be about this quintessential part of black culture of being at the roller skating rink, being around other black people unapologetically and having fun while doing it. Presently, roller skater Erin Jackson made history by being the first black woman to win an Olympic gold medal in the Winter Olympics for an individual sport, that sport being speed skating. She started out as a roller skater and skated on the Jacksonville Roller Derby League on four separate teams. Roller skating has also made a resurgence in popularity with many black creators posting tips on how to get better and showing off their skills in the rink on TikTok. With Bear News, I'm Isabella Marcus Porter. Thanks, Isabella. It's cool to see a unique activity like roller skating tied to bringing a marginalized community together. Thanks for joining us today for a special edition of Bear News. We'll see you next time.